Um, I assume now that we are going about to go online and uh, that's why I would address you and welcome you again uh, and all our many thousands online registrants and I do this on behalf also of Tex Kaisun who unfortunately by a, that he had contacted, contracted COVID could not come and cannot come in person. However, he will address you and say his uh, greetings uh, right in a, in a minute or after I have finished here. And um, it's just to say that this is the first central meeting that we have organized uh, uh, for the reason that now it's a decade that we have initiated the World Sepsis Day movement and that we launched for the first, the first World Sepsis Declaration. And uh, we just had also a board meeting uh, of the Sepsis Foundation here in Germany and it was a very moving event also because also the Sepsis Stiftung was founded ten, ten years ago now and many also of the people who, who are in this room now have contributed a lot also to the adoption of the world Sepsis uh, declaration by World Sepsis uh, 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 resolution by the WHO, including Chancellor, former Chancellor Minister Helge Braun, who was with us online and who will address us in the evening. He was a driving force together with the Global Sepsis Alliance and the ministers of health of these German-speaking countries that the adoption of this resolution, which really made a difference, occurred. And even more so, we are proud that uh, the new minister of health in 2012, uh, 2022, has achieved to get this topic also on the agenda of the G7, not only ministers of health, but also in the final declaration by the G7 leaders and we have good hope that this will also take place if not this year uh, for, for sure but for the next year that also the G20 leaders will for the first time address and make clear the close relationship between pandemic preparedness, between infection prevention between AMR and sepsis. And what we need indeed to get this together is national and international infection management strategies which involve this, all these major global health threat which have so much in common. And that's one of our key topics to make this possible. So, with having said this, again, welcome and thank you for coming. There are still a lot of people uh, to be expected. And now I hand over uh, to Tex uh, and to the message uh, of Tex, also to welcome him, you on his side. Thank you very much. Dear friends, I am Tex Kasun, president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. I regret very much that I cannot be there in person to welcome each and every one of you and to thank you personally for your dedication to sepsis and uh, the um, Global Sepsis Alliance over the years. I recall that we started modestly a little over 10 years ago and uh, with a small group of us um, over the years, the Global Sepsis Alliance family has grown and we have achieved uh, great successes in many areas. However, we need to continue to work diligently to decrease the burden and improve outcomes from sepsis. 
At this event, making sepsis a national and global health priority, we will learn um, some of the pro of some of the progress that we've made over the years, some of our achievements in quality improvement and advocacy, but also um, intend to discuss a way forward such that we can continue uh, what we have been doing. I would like to thank uh, some of our esteemed guests, such as the WHO Director, Dr. Tedros uh, uh, Gab Gabriosis, patron of the event, as well as uh, Dr. Akim Schneider uh, from UNDP uh, Administrator and the German Health Minister, Car Dr. Karl Lottenberg. Uh, while I cannot be there and I sorely will miss uh, being uh, this meeting, I cannot think of anyone more apt to represent us than Dr. Conrad Reinhardt, the founding president, and who has been the guiding light of us for so many years. I am certain that, um, that uh, Conrad uh, uh, will be um, very much uh, willing and able to uh, shoulder this load as he has done in the past. And I look forward to meeting many of you and working with you in the coming years. Thank you very much. Um, and have a good day. Dear friends, I am Flex Kassoon, President of the Global. Thank you very much, uh, Tex, and it's, it's a pity that you cannot, couldn't make it uh, for these reasons, and it's a great pleasure, uh, and my commitment uh, and all the commitment of the new board members of the GSA and also of the Sepsis Foundations are willing to move uh, forward. So it's now also a great pleasure that uh, the WHO director, Dr. Tetres, will take up this issue and, is, and speak to us on this occasion because you should know and must know that in 2017, sepsis was just not mentioned except for maternal and neonatal sepsis on the websites of the CDC, on the websites of the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, and also on the website of the WHO. And this has changed dramatically. The WHO is committed now and has understood the burden of sepsis, and we will hear more about the burden of sepsis, and that's why we are so grateful uh, also to have in person here, uh, Dr. Eckers, Rudy Eckers, uh, who is the Director of Integrated Health Service in person, and he represents the WHO in person here, but even more so, we welcome now uh, the welcome and the greetings uh, by Dr. Eckers. Dear colleagues and friends, sepsis kills 11 million people every year, often due to lack of safe and effective antimicrobials to treat it. The COVID-19 pandemic made things worse, both because the virus can cause organ dysfunction and because of the severe disruptions to health services, leading to delays in the diagnosis and management of sepsis. Five years ago, the nations of the world committed at the World Health Assembly to improve the prevention, diagnosis, and clinical management of sepsis. Although we have accomplished much, as a global community, we still have a lot of work to do. The best defense against sepsis is strong, responsive, and resilient health systems. Around the world, WHO is supporting countries to deliver safer, cleaner, and better quality care to engage communities and to protect precious medicines from the threat of antimicrobial resistance. I thank the Global Sepsis Alliance, the German Sepsis Foundation, and all national sepsis advocates for your leadership and advocacy in this area. With your support, we can prevent sepsis, prevent suffering, and save lives. 
Thank you, and I wish you a productive discussion. I had mentioned already the crucial role and important role that also some leaders in the field and especially also ministers of health have over time understood how important sepsis is in terms of human suffering, in terms of the need of more research, in terms of Im improving our healthcare systems in many ways, in terms of quality improvement of sepsis care and prevention. And I mentioned it already that the new Minister of Health, Karl Lauterbach, being himself a public health physician and a visiting professor at Harvard University, has had the took the chance to get this on the agenda of G7, and that's why he is speaking to us. Unfortunately, for understandable reasons, he cannot, could, it, could not make it in person here, and he also has a two-minute uh, greetings and video message to all of us. Many people are aware of the early signs of a stroke or heart attack. Reacting quickly can often provide the person the crucial seconds they need. Early detection and intervention can also save lives in the case of sepsis. However, the general public are still too unaware of the symptoms of sepsis. Furthermore, sepsis is also frequently the cause of death in severe COVID-19 infections. The campaign Germany recognizes sepsis is aimed at increasing awareness about the symptoms of sepsis. Might it be sepsis? This question should be firmly embedded in people's minds, both among the population as a whole, but also among medical staff. After all, this question can save lives. Sepsis is the third leading cause of death in Germany. Experts believe that more than a quarter of these deaths could be avoided. Worldwide, a total of 11 million people die every year as a result of sepsis. People from lower income countries are particularly affected. All this must prompt us into action. I was therefore very pleased to take on the patronage of the 10th World Sepsis Day. Public awareness of sepsis has risen considerably in recent years. At the same time, we must admit that we are still far from realizing our visions, namely zero preventable deaths and a world free of sepsis. On my initiative, the fight against sepsis is also on the agenda of the G7 health ministers. We want to give the implementation of the 2017 WHO resolution a boost. We all want, but also need, to increase our efforts in the fight against sepsis. I want to thank you all for your efforts, and I wish you fruitful debates and new insights. As I said, another quantum leap in the fight against sepsis. And now I would like to announce somebody uh, who also contributed a lot that this WHO resolution happened. It's Achim Steiner. At this time, he was the director of the United Environment and Development Department of the, by the United Nations. And in his, and he had deeply understood from the very beginning that the success or failure in the fight against sepsis will have impact on the achievements of the sustainable de development goals which were set out by the United Nations for 2030. And that's why he followed our invitation to a symposium by the National Academy of Science, Leopoldina, that was held 
in Vienna in 2016, and it was the very same symposium where the former Minister of Health, Hermann Gruhe, announced that jointly with his German-speaking ministers of health, he will go and aim for having sepsis on the agenda of the World Health Assembly in 2013. And Achim Steiner, by the way, a very good friend of a very active member of the German SEPNet Quality and Research Network, which is under the umbrella of the Sepsis Foundation, could convince him also to hand over a letter to, to, to Margaret Chan, who is a colleague of hers, and I think it was very important that, Marvin, that Margaret Chan got this message by him and that's also added to the fact that we are so happy that this resolution was finally adopted. And he, Achim Steiner is still on our side and he will address us with a welcome address and he has used the United Nations Environment and Development um, Group, he calls it Sister Families of the United Nations, to spread this message also around the globe via the United Nations. Thank you, Achim, from here, and we look forward to his message now. Professor Dr. Konrad Reinhardt, President of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this year, we mark the 10th anniversary of World Sepsis Day. It is a timely moment to raise awareness of the global health threat posed by sepsis. This life-threatening response to an infection remains under-recognized. If not diagnosed early and treated promptly, it can lead to shock, multi-organ failure and death. Indeed, patients who are critically ill with COVID-19 and other infectious diseases are amongst those at higher risk of developing sepsis and eventually dying from it. Known as the silent killer, sepsis kills someone every 2.8 seconds. Yet sepsis is not merely an issue confined to the health sphere. It is also a pressing development issue. Approximately 85% of sepsis cases and sepsis-related deaths worldwide occur in low- and middle-income countries. It particularly affects vulnerable populations, including those aged over 60, newborn children, and people with pre-existing conditions. Indeed, reduced access to infection prevention strategies and resilient healthcare systems in developing countries is resulting in significantly poorer outcomes. We know that tackling sepsis is crucial to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. To achieve the SDG 3 targets, including the reduction of child mortality, and to expand universal health coverage, we must accelerate action to address the burden of sepsis in both high- and low-income countries. With the recognition that most cases are either preventable or treatable if caught in time, the World Health Organization is leading global efforts to tackle the scourge of sepsis. That means acting upon the lessons of COVID-19, focusing on equity, strengthening health systems, and investing in prevention. As a foundation, hygiene is vital. We must ensure that everyone has access to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation. Notable progress is now being made. For instance, between the years 2015 and 2020, 107 million people gained access to safely managed drinking water at home. In addition, the United Nations is providing healthcare workers with vital skills. It is also informing communities on infection risks and the need to promptly seek care. We know that prevention is a first line of defense against sepsis. To this end, the UN family is working to ensure access to safe and affordable medicines and vaccines, which reduce the risk of contracting infections. Look, for instance, to the work of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which is supporting immunization programs in developing countries through public-private partnerships. Or to COVAX, which has delivered 1.6 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine to 146 countries. Led by key actors, including the World Health Organization and UNICEF, our sister agencies, this work is ultimately helping to prevent millions of sepsis infections. 
The United Nations and its many partners are also working to strengthen health information systems and ensure access to rapid diagnostic tools. We also know that most studies of sepsis have been conducted in high-income countries. There is limited scientific evidence from the rest of the world. The global community must do more to improve high-quality data collection along with more research into treatments. We also need a renewed focus on sepsis prevention amongst newborns and on tackling antimicrobial resistance, an important driver of the condition. Professor Reinhardt, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the Global Sepsis Alliance for their dedicated efforts to raise awareness and make sepsis a national and global priority. Reflecting a new momentum, consider the commitment made by the G7 health ministers earlier this year to intensify efforts to confront sepsis. Indeed, contextualizing investments in sepsis prevention and treatment within the global movement around pandemic prevention, preparedness and response is also a clear opportunity. Moreover, the new pandemic accord being developed has a vital role to play in tackling the conditions that allow sepsis to flourish. Finally, please continue to rely on the support of the United Nations family, UNDP, to deploy the latest science, technology and innovation to stop sepsis in its tracks. Thank you so much for your work, your leadership, and let us hope that the world will quickly learn the vital lessons that you have been at the forefront of advocating. Yeah, I think uh, this um, video message speaks for itself. And you will see another version also in the opening uh, for our celebration event. And uh, Dr. Lauterbach has mentioned already the initiative Germany recognizes sepsis. And this is indeed the first initiative which has been funded by the German Minister of Health to raise and educate healthcare workers and even more so the general public. And based on a great idea uh, of our long-term collaborators, the Action Coalition for Patient Safety called Aktionsbündnis Patientensicherheit, Dr. Ruth Hecker, had the idea for this kind of campaign, Deutschland erkennt sepsis. And I want to mention also that this was not only the idea, though, that the, this action coalition was a long-term supporter and collaborator for the Sepsis Stiftung and the Sepsis Aid and also the Sepsis Dialogue, who with whom we joined forces within this campaign. And I'm very glad that also she has provided a short message to us because, again, for some family reasons, they could not be here uh, today. And welcome in some way also Dr. Hecker for this important collaboration and to make sure how important this collaboration is because we also have World Patient Safety Day and as sepsis very likely is the number one cause of preventable death on the globe. This collaboration and this understanding is very important. Dear Mr. Reinhardt, dear Mr. Kisun, dear Federal of Health Mr. Lauterbach, Dear Mr. Schwarze, dear participants of the event Making Sepsis a National and Global Health Priority, celebrating 10 years of World Sepsis Day. I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity of welcoming you today in my capacity as Chairwoman of the German Coalition of Patient Safety. The German Coalition for Patient Safety has set itself the task of focusing on patients and their safety in medical treatment. This is my passion. 
The aim is to promote patient safety continuously, sustainably, and demonstrably. We commit ourselves to improving public health by bringing together stakeholders from health organizations, health insurance providers, the health industries, and many more. Currently, we are particularly concerned with a medical condition that causes a lot of preventable deaths, sepsis. To tackle the medical condition effectively, we have launched a national campaign, Germany recognizes sepsis, Deutschland erkennt sepsis. In this campaign, we have brought together organizations that bring in an array of expertise in the field of sepsis. First of their, its today hosts, the German Sepsis Foundation, which brings in more than 10 years of experience in sepsis research. Thank you, Ms. Reinhardt, for your personal strength and untiring commitment so that sepsis gets the attention that the topic deserves. Secondly, we are supported by the team of the Sepsis Dialogue of Greifswald, the University Medical Center, which provides a unique medical perspective to this topic. Last but not least, our partner Zepsis Hilfe allows us to get in touch with people who are affected by Zepsis and can provide a first-hand report of what it is like to be stricken with this dire condition. Our expertise in advocacy and ensuring patient safety allows us to successfully lead this group of extraordinary organizations in order to raise awareness of Zepsis among the public and healthcare professionals. After all, sepsis mortality remains high in Germany. Sepsis is considered the third leading cause of death after cardiovascular disease and cancer. Through better education of the population, but also of medical professionals, many deaths and severe cases of the disease that causes lifelong damages could be avoided. This is where the Deutsche Erkan Sepsis campaign comes in. It informs different target groups about sepsis and provides information about its development, recognition and secondary diseases. Sepsis can occur in any life situation at any age. Therefore, the question, could it be sepsis, should come naturally for everyone. Sepsis should be recognized as a life-threatening condition and an emergency because early interventions minimize the high burden of disease and death. Our campaign was successfully launched in February 2021 and has been financially supported by the Federal Ministry of Health since July 2021, a successful first year. The setup of the campaign is behind us. No further cornerstones for long-term collaboration and the implementation of envisaged measures are being laid. To confront sepsis globally as well as nationally, it is of great importance that international high-level policymakers, representatives of federal agencies and patients' organizations are aware of the importance of education about sepsis. Dear Mr. Reinhardt, congratulations on 10 years World Sepsis Day and good luck for the next years. We are by your side. Thank you very much. So it's uh, my great uh, pleasure now to announce uh, Dr. Susan uh, Jacob, who is also a physician and uh, she is very dedicated to public health and she has a lot of experience gained as a regional director for Europe of WHO and now she joins us and has a position of deputy director of the WHO and uh, so she will present on the WHO strategy to fight infection and sepsis, and we should welcome her to Hello, Dr. Jacob. Hello, and I'm very happy to be with you, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues participating today. Firstly, let me say thank you very much to the Global Sepsis Alliance and the German Federal Ministry of Health for hosting this very important scientific event. 
Secondly, today is a special and timely day to meet around the sepsis agenda as we celebrate 10 years of the World Sepsis Day. Much has already been done and we have more to accomplish together. Recent years have shown that the emergence of new infectious threats can cause disruption in the global socio-economic and political architecture with consequences to health systems. Infection-related global health threats, such as severe acute respiratory infections and blood-borne viruses, and the emergence of antimicrobial-resistant pathogens, are everyone's business. Furthermore, there is an ongoing silent endemic burden of healthcare-associated infections that occur every day in all the countries, mainly caused by pathogens resistant to antimicrobials. It is estimated that in 2019, the death associated with bacterial antimicrobial resistance were almost 5 million globally. And we are aware that the three most impactful antibiotic-resistant microorganisms are typically acquired in healthcare. Together, they account for 70% of the burden of antimicrobial resistance and sepsis in terms of disability and premature mortality. <clears throat> the risk of acquiring <clears throat> an infection during healthcare delivery and of suffering from its deadly consequences doubles and can be up to 10 ta 20 times higher in low and middle income countries. Almost half of all global sepsis cases worldwide occur in children with an estimated 20 million cases every year. For every 1,000 women giving birth 11 will experience infection-related severe organ dysfunction or death. But sepsis is a preventable uh, tragedy, and nothing works better than infection prevention and control. Infection prevention and control action is acknowledged as playing a prominent role in curbing emerging and ongoing infectious threats ranging from water, sanitation, and hygiene measures in the community and in healthcare facilities to preventing specific conditions such as antimicrobial resistance and sepsis. For example, hand hygiene and environmental hygiene in healthcare facilities were found to be able to more than half the risk of dying because of infections with antimicrobial resistant pathogens. Improving hand hygiene in healthcare settings would save about 16.5 US dollar for every dollar invested. Furthermore, recent data from WHO and the partners showed that the investments needed to ensure all healthcare facilities in the least developed countries have basic water and sanitation facilities are modest. 6.5 to 9.6 billion US dollar over 10 years, accounting for only 3% of current government spending on health. WHO is responding to large gaps in infrastructure, supplies and practices particularly in low- and middle-income countries, with critical steps to improve infection prevention and control action, including a new resolution on this topic and a proposal for a stronger and a more inclusive health emergency preparedness, response and resilience architecture. Both were presented and approved at the 75th World Health Assembly in May 2022. Whilst infection prevention and control is key, and perhaps the most cost-effective means to reduce the burden of sepsis, we are also working closely with partners, policymakers, and implementers on several fronts to fight infection-related global 
and local health threat and achieve the progress requested by the World Health Assembly resolution on sepsis. For example, in the sepsis prevention field, over the last three years, we issued more than 20 guidance documents and associated implementation tools on infection prevention. We established the Global Task Force on Water and Sanitation Facilities in healthcare facilities to address key bottlenecks in this area. We launched a WHO UNICEF country tracker online that provides real-time updates on country progress in implementing the eight practical steps to improve water and sanitation in healthcare facilities. In the context of sepsis epidemiology and surveillance, we published the first global report on sepsis in 2020. We launched the global collection of data on AMR in patients with bloodstream infection through the WHO Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System, which is called GLASS. We are developing adapted definitions for healthcare-associated infection surveillance, including sepsis, for low-resource settings. In the clinical management of sepsis field, we have developed evidence-based recommendations for the clinical management of COVID-19 and the clinical care pathway detailing the patient's journey through the health system. We recently published chapters on management of sepsis and other septic complications of severe infections within the WHO toolkit for clinical care for severe acute respiratory infections. We are currently working on the new sepsis clinical management guidelines and the WHO academic course on primary care to support first contact providers. In the field of prevention, diagnosis and management of maternal and neonatal sepsis, we are supporting research on improving adherence to best practices in prevention and management of sepsis. We are convening policymakers and experts to develop policy and regulatory pathways needed for the Streptococcus B vaccine. We have published key findings of implementation research on the outpatient management of possible serious bacterial infection from seven countries in the neonatal infection collection. We published the WHO coordinated multi-country, multi-center randomized control trial to measure the effect of kangaroo mother care initiated immediately after birth to prevent the neonatal mortality including due to sepsis. To continue in the direction of improvement, especially at the country level, we need decisive political commitment and action by the national and local leadership at its highest levels. Continuous progress in research and effective implementation of evidence-based measures and the engagement of the community in the fight against sepsis. Distinguished colleagues, I would like to thank you very much for being such exceptional champions in the fight to sepsis, and I hope we can continue to closely work together in this endeavor. I wish you a successful meeting and above all, real progress in the fight against preventable infections. Thank you for your attention and back, back to you, Chair. I think indeed uh, we have to thank uh, WHO that they have scaled up uh, their efforts and uh, they put all their experiences uh, in infection control and uh, fighting also the pandemics which we know have their threat by killing people with 
and this is true for any pandemic due to multiple organ failure and septic shock. So this is, must become a common understanding and WHO and health authorities and ministers of health can do such a great, great job to foster this understanding. But sepsis is not only a health political issue, it's mostly and often a tragedy for families and survivors. And that's why it's my great pleasure in some way this, that Mr. Joachim Groiner, who has lost only some time ago his wife and his unborn son from sepsis in a high quality center in Germany. And that's why he is committed and he has expressed this just in our, during our board meeting of the German Sepsis Foundation to join our forces to bring him in his experience as a lawyer. And unfortunately, his son uh, has an infection right now. That's why he could not come personally, but he will join us via Zoom and uh, yeah, welcome him with me. And this is exactly what we need, that everybody who understands that this is not only a health economic and health related global threat, but that is always about individuals who unnecessarily often have to suffer from this disease. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Professor Reinhardt, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to speak to you personally today. I very much regret that I cannot be in Berlin in person today. But my first son is ill and I have to stay at home. The topic of sepsis was not present for me until three years ago. I never get in touch with this disease before. Then the fate of sepsis reached me and my family with all its harshness. At the beginning of 2019, my wife and I were expecting our second son. Maxime was due to be born in mid-June. In April 2019, together with our first son, Niklas, we had another beautiful vacation before fate changed our family forever. Because my wife and my unbound son died in the hospital as a result of an unrecognized sepsis. In May 2019, my pregnant wife felt very unwell and developed a high fever. We decided to see the gynecologist immediately. As a result, we were referred to the hospital. In one of the most renowned hospitals in Germany, a fate took place that day, which has seriously changed my life to this day. When we arrived at the hospital, my wife had a fever of 40 degrees. For a total of 16 hours, four doctors did not recognize that my wife was ill with sepsis. They thought the symptoms were the flu and gave her fever-reducing medication. A few hours later, first, Maxime, my unborn son, died in my wife's belly. And the next day, my wife lost her battle against this insidious disease. It is still unbelievable to this day, the speed at which sepsis took half of my family. Before this fate, I had not dealt with the issue of sepsis. It was too abstract and I did not know anyone who had suffered from sepsis before. Today, I know how important the fight for prevention is because I assume that if doctors and nurses had been well trained or educated, my son and wife would still be alive today. Through many fortunate circumstances, I was able to meet Professor Reinhardt, who also encouraged me to become involved in the Sepsis Foundation and to speak to you here today. If you deal with the topic of sepsis, you quickly realize that a large number of deaths could have been avoided. Important aspects play a role here, such as education of the population, 
but also significantly improve training and education of doctors and nurses. Germany likes to see itself as a leading nation in the field of health. But unfortunately, we are only average when it comes to sepsis prevention. The education of the population and the early detection of sepsis must improve in Germany. This also requires political will, which unfortunately has not always been present in the recent years. Thanks to the work of the Sepsis Foundation and the many partners in Germany and worldwide, politicians now seem to have understood that, in addition to education, on the topics of cancer or corona, comprehensive education on sepsis is urgently needed. Due to my personal fate, the importance of this work has become clear to me. Therefore, I will be involved in the Sepsis Foundation in the future and try to support Professor Reinhardt in his fight against sepsis. Thanks for your attention and the opportunity to have spoken to you here today. Thank you so much, uh, especially for not simply accepting what happened. And uh, another, and to join our fight, and another person who is in this room and who will shortly speak to us is Dennis Gradler. And he called me once and tried to understand what happened to him. And since then, he has joined us. And since several years, he is a member of the executive committee and vice president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And dear Dennis, please come up here and uh, yeah, explain to us what made you <laughs> to yeah, what you suffered and what you experienced and what your thoughts are on this fight against sepsis. Thank you, Conrad. Um, it's great to be here, not only physically here in Berlin today, but here, in, um, here on Earth, because if everything, everything had gone according to plan, I would not be here anymore today. I had sepsis, as Conrad said, about six years ago, um, and it's only a series of coincidences that wouldn't normally have happened that uh, saved my life. And as Joachim just said as well, um, before I ended up with sepsis in intensive care, in a coma, um, and then uh, later on in an eight-month stay in hospital, I had never heard of sepsis before. Um, what's striking to me is that had the health system, this is the Belgian health system, also known as a very good health system, had the, had the health system been left to work as it was set up to do, I would be one of those deaths that we've already been talking about um, this morning and will continue to hear about so much um, today. I was lucky. Um, I'm still alive. I came away with a disability. Um, and that means that sepsis entered my life in 2016 and is never going to leave again. And while, of course, sepsis causes death and disability for far too many people already, it also affects, as we've just heard from Joachim as well, um, the families of sepsis patients um, who themselves have no sepsis at all. So when we talk about the number of cases of sepsis today, we also have to remember that the number of people that are actually affected by sepsis is much, much larger still than only the sepsis patients. If we then realize that many cases of sepsis are preventable and that sepsis could affect basically any one of us, anyone out there tomorrow, um, then you realize we're really talking about a system failure that really does need fixing. And so ultimately, it's going to have to be policymakers that are going to help doing the fixing. But um, 
we, we, we know that there are a number of things that they can do. Um, they, they should be devising national sepsis action plans, for example. Um, and that actually should get easier as more countries develop their own national sepsis action plans. You, other countries can learn from them. So in principle, it should become uh, easier the more countries adopt those. Uh, but policymakers, of course, don't get re-elected on fixing problems that no one is aware of. And so it's really important that we speak out even more on sepsis than uh, we are doing already, all of us. And I've now been involved with the Global Sepsis Alliance for about five years. Um, uh, I, I think uh, that uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance um, with, um, honestly, the, the very modest resources that it has, has done a fantastic job at raising um, awareness and it's, it's very gratifying in the, in the uh, uh, awareness raising efforts that I do myself personally. Um, I've heard a few times from, from several people, uh, because we knew about your story, we've been able to identify sepsis um, in, in our families and we've been able to uh, address it before it was too late. I've also heard the opposite. I've heard that, uh, you know, I've had, uh, uh, from someone else, uh, they, they had a, 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 somebody pass away from sepsis in their family, and they said, look, I, I didn't realize that uh, it was the same thing that you had been telling us about. I just simply didn't connect the dots. So the learning, I think, from that experience is um, we, we have to make it more personal. It's not enough. It's absolutely essential that we all talk about sepsis. But we're going to have to become even more personal. As Joachim also just said, it's still too abstract to people. So we have to get closer to people, to individuals, um, and, there, and, and that really means there need to be more of us speaking up, us, survivors, families. But the problem is, of course, how do we find them? There must be many of them out there. We know there are many of them out there, but we don't necessarily know where to find them. And that's where doctors can help us. The doctors in the room and online, you can help us uh, point sepsis survivors or their families, uh, families also of, uh, of sepsis patients that, uh, that uh, passed away, um, point them to us. The, uh, the, the Global Sepsis Alliance, Regional Sepsis Alliances, National Alliances, any of us. Sepsis is a global problem, but it needs global solutions. Sorry, it needs local solutions, of course. Um, and it's amazing to see the global audience that we have today, um, here in the room and also online. And I would like to thank all of you for your commitment to fighting sepsis. It already feels very much to me like we're all on the same team. And that's really reassuring. To the policymakers, I would say, first of all, thank you for doing already what you are doing to help. But also, tell us what you need from us. What do we need to help? Uh, what do we need to do uh, that we help you to help us? But also to the policymakers, be creative. Think about what you can do, often very easily, to put sepsis on the agenda to just talk about it, make it an issue, something um, that we can then uh, uh, jump on and use as a platform to raise awareness further. To the patients and the families, I would say, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your courage to speak up. It's not easy. Uh, but also encourage others that you might come across to speak up. To the medical professionals, I would say, help us as I just was outlining, make this more personal. Point people to us that you think could help us um, with, uh, with the cause. And then finally, to the sponsors, I say thank you for your support. Um, and uh, please continue to support us and help us find maybe additional sponsors that uh, share our cause as well. So the first 10 years of the World Sepsis Day have been groundbreaking. I am personally honored to have been able to be around for that, uh, for about half of that time. Uh, and so let's build on this together and take the fight against sepsis to the next level. Thank you all very much for your support.
So the next person who will speak up is Kieran Staunton. And it's true to say that no family, also on a global level so far, has done more to raise awareness on sepsis, both on the political health authority and personal level than this family, and you will more hear more about it, obviously, by Kirian, who understood, and this, I think, is very important, that he thought and is still thinking that this experience must not only happen again in the state of New York, but all over the world. And his commitment, you can follow, that he already in 2013, one year after the tragic death of his son, he joined us in Berlin for a meeting which at this time we called a sepsis summit just to underpin the need for a national sepsis plan in Germany to launch a memorandum for such plan. And again, he is with us almost 10 years later, and most country in the world, countries in the world still don't or are far from having a national sepsis strategy. And that's why I am so glad that not only Kirian is here again, but also explained to us that he or and all at his wife will join also structurally and support the work of the Global Sexist Alliance. Please welcome Kirian Staunton uh, here in Berlin. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, everyone. Special welcome to those watching around the world. My thanks to Global Sepsis Alliance and the German Sepsis Foundation for inviting me to give this keynote address here this morning. And thank you, Conrad, for your warm welcome and your international inspirational leadership over the last number of years. Yes, we met here 10 years ago and we launched the initiative. And since then, over one million people have died in Germany of sepsis. And three and a half million Americans have died of sepsis in those 10 years. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Kieran Staunton. My wife Orla and our daughter Kathleen and I buried our 12-year-old son, Rory, 10 years ago from undiagnosed and untreated sepsis, who died at a major New York City hospital. Rory was a very healthy child. He was five foot nine. He was 160 pounds or 72 kilograms. One day he scraped his arm while playing in school. Overnight he spiked a fever. The next day we brought him to the hospital and the pediatrician and the emergency department where each medical professional examined him, dismissed our concerns and sent him home with a diagnosis for gastric flu. Rory, however, was very sick and the following day his symptoms worsened. We returned to the hospital where he was admitted to the ICU. That was Friday evening. At six o'clock on that Sunday, our beautiful son died. A unnecessary and preventable death. 
When we were told that Rory died from sepsis, we had never heard of the word. In fact, as Rory lay dying in the hospital that weekend, the word sepsis was never once mentioned to us. If Rory had received the correct diagnosis and treatment, he would be alive today. I have given many speeches in the last 10 years about Rory's death, but I'll never be able to verbalize the, the agonizing pain, the, the hardship and the torture that comes with the loss of our child. And the struggle to keep going, especially when we think Rory's life could have been saved. His death was totally preventable. I'm sorry, I just, I'm, I'm meant to go on to a um, graph here. I think this is, I hope I'm doing it right. Okay. That's it, right? This one, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Tragically, since Rory's death, we have heard different versions of his story repeated again and again. Families who never heard from sepsis, their concerns dismissed by healthcare providers, lives cut short, families broken. After Rory's death, we learned that in the United States alone, Sepsis kills over 350,000 people a year. It kills more Americans than AIDS, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and opioids combined. And yet we had never heard of it. Shortly after Rory died, my wife Orla and I established in Sepsis the legacy of Rory Staunton. Our goal was to ensure that what happened to our family would never happen again. And you will see this slide here that's behind you. We actually got that, that graph made up. We delivered that to every member of the House of Congress to shock people into saying, here it is. And they said, well, why didn't we hear of it? We prevent, presented that to everyone. That's an indictment of you, not of us. What we discovered about sepsis in the United States, there was no federal, state, or city government policy or mandated measures on sepsis whatsoever. There was no widespread use of hospital protocols. The CDC had no policy or directives on sepsis and no campaigns to improve public awareness. There was no sepsis education in schools. The internet was almost silent on the subject. In a nutshell, in the United States, when our son died, there was no template or plan how to tackle this killer in our midst. We had to start from scratch. Here's some of what we achieved in 10 years and what we hope to achieve moving forward in America and beyond. First, I'd like to the address the issue of personal stories in this fight. After Rory died, we told our story repeatedly to national and international media. Rory's story was written about on the front page of the New York Times and other major publications. We realized that it was very hard for policymakers and decision makers to ignore the plight and the pleas of heartbroken parents and children. We formed the National Family Council on Sepsis, a coalition of impacted families as a unifying force, bring them together, be their voice, and we are their voice. We took our campaign to Washington. There was no doors open for us. We had to push them all in or kick them all in. We knocked on doors, we shared our story, we prevented graphs, we asked why nothing was being done. As a result, the United States Senate held its very first ever hearing on sepsis in 2014, where I testified. We engaged with the CDC. 
After Rory's death, we visited the CDC website, desperate to understand what this sepsis was, what had killed our child, and we found nothing on the CDC A to Z website for sepsis. No information on the condition that was killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. When we visited their place in Atlanta, they had nothing printed in the building on sepsis. The only printed material in the building was a pamphlet that we brought in with us that day. To us, this om omission cut to the heart of the sepsis problem. It was a crisis that most people seemed to be doing their best to ignore. In 2013, we held the very first national forum on sepsis in Washington. For the first time ever, this was done. We brought the politicians, the federal agencies, the patient advocates, the decision makers, and we put them all into one room. We put them talking. How could they deal with an issue if they weren't talking to each other about it? We put them into the one room, and we've done it every year since. Dr. Reinhardt was one of the speakers. Back in New York State, our work focused on changing hospital policies to ensure that when a patient with sepsis enters a hospital, they are met with healthcare professionals who know how to identify and treat sepsis, something Rory was denied. Our, our previous speaker also spoke about how many doctors looked at his wife, an unborn child, for many hours and all the symptoms and they didn't know what they were dealing with. We formed a coalition of agencies and organisations to tackle the issue of sepsis. These efforts resulted in Rory's regulations, as they are known. And that requires hospitals to develop evidence-based protocols for their early identification and treatment of sepsis and submit them to the New York State Department of Health for approval. Edu educate providers on the protocols. Publicly report the outcomes. These protocols ensured the rapid diagnosis and treatment of sepsis with antibiotics and fluids, and most importantly, include an accountability mechanism that is often missing from this kind of measure. Rory's regulations require that the Department of Health audit all hospitals, report data back to the hospitals quarterly to foster local improvement. It is crucial that these measures are compulsory and that accountability is in place, because voluntary doesn't count. The hospital that our son died in had a voluntary sepsis initiative in place. They didn't get around to using it because it was voluntary. Voluntary is left to them. It shouldn't be, not when it comes to someone's life. Going forward, it's either compulsory, it's mandatory, or then you're just changing one form with another and you're bringing on death. Voluntary to me is just in death in another area. It needs to be compulsory. The regulations also include a parent's bill of rights designed to, design to improve communications with parents and caregivers to ensure that test results are received, reviewed before discharge, something that would certainly have saved Rory's life. We now know that Rory's regulations in New York alone saved over 16,000 lives in New York between 2015 and 2019. So if someone says to us, regulations are, do not work, are there a chance that there's something else, there are 16,000 New Yorkers walking alive today that will be dead but for Rory's regulations. That is a testimony to itself. Furthermore, paediatric mortality decreased by 40% when the treatment bundle was administered within an hour of sepsis recognition. Another important policy shift in New York State has been the creation of Roy Staunton's law. This requires all professionals working in a healthcare related profession to undertake infection prevention training. Roy Staunton's law in New York now covers more than 460,000 workers across the state. And by the way, an awful lot of the work that we have given and the stats and everything we knew in New York came from a lot of hard grafting by people who are working for the New York State Department of Health. One of them is led by someone who's here today and will speak later. His work is, is, is remarkable. Dr. Marcus Friedrich, I want to recognize you for all your work. Thank you very much, and I know you're going to speak later. And God bless you. It's, it takes a person to lead. 
Federal action, New York's regulations are America's most effective policies to date. We know the real solution is nationally mandated approach to the identification and treatment of sepsis and funds and resources. In short, we are fighting for sepsis to be treated as a national health crisis that it is. And there is reason for this optimism. In sepsis is currently working with a stellar group of leaders we have put together across the United States about ending the sepsis crisis. We have worked to create a framework for a national approach to sepsis, with funding crucially attached, have held meetings at the highest level of the United States government to build consensus. We will soon be making announcements about this work in the very near future. Also on September the 13th this year, World Sepsis Day, Senator Charles Sumer, the leader of the United States Senate, spoke on the Senate floor, the first time ever, about sepsis. He spoke about the gravity of the crisis, the need for a national approach to combat it. He urged federal officials to do better and strongly advocated for Roy's regulations as, as a national guideline. He also, in the United States, in a bipartisan measure, both parties took the leadership, have allocated that sem September the 13th going forward in the United States shall be known as National Sepsis Day. These are many firsts with big implications. Of course, strong policy initiatives are only half the battle. We now know that in the United States, sepsis originates outside the hospital. I think this is very important for everyone because over the years, people say sepsis was hospital acquired, health acquired. 87% of the cases in the United States happen in the community. They had it when they walked into the hospital. Our public awareness initiatives rely heavily on personal stories. Our awareness strategy includes traditional media, PSAs, compelling social media. We have developed relationships with healthcare groups, labor unions, professional associations to share our measure. Most recently, we developed a major campaign to increase awareness of maternal sepsis among patients and providers. And this is what's fairly frightening. The US has the highest rate of maternal sepsis of any wealthy nation. And sepsis is the second leading cause of maternal death. With funding we got from the federal government, we worked with New York State Department of Health to identify and produce educational materials to those at higher risk. These include pregnant women of color, very young pregnant people, and those who want to under C-section deliveries. We partnered with the major teachers union, nurses unions, and others to develop a K through 12 through education curriculum that teaches children about infection. Over three million New York children have access to this, it's free. It is also available nationally. The challenge of sepsis differs in each country, but it's the same killer in every country. We believe that some of our approaches can be implemented by other groups across the world. We believe the recommendations could be lead with personal stories, reach people through grief and heartbreak, refuse to be sidelined and silenced, refuse to be ignored, commit to holding leaders accountable, whether they're elected leaders, appointed leaders, medical leaders or other leaders. We deserve to have our children and our loved ones living. We shouldn't be buying coffins for our children and our parents and our unborn children and our wives. Demand a national response to sepsis. Work to ensure that everyone can identify the signs of sepsis and seek a medical, a medical treatment. We call on all government and public health communities to step up and change behavior. We look forward to working closely with Global Alliance and other organizations. In the USA, we have created a template. It has saved lives. Remember, we're not waiting for a cure for sepsis here. We're waiting for leadership. We're waiting for people to step up. We're waiting for people to do for sepsis what they've done for everything else. Why shouldn't our loved ones have that right? The urgency is now, and make sepsis a national and global priority is something that we fully stand behind. So we're right behind with you, Conrad. We're right behind everyone, and we need to bring this thing to fruition. We've addressed the WHO. We've addressed all the groups. Ten years later, too many coffins, too many deaths, too many loved ones. 
We lost 25% of our families to sepsis. Our earlier speaker lost their families and loved ones. Let's get this thing moving and let's get it together. Thank you very much for your time. Upwards and onwards. Thank you very much.